With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. One thing optometry has been missing is a unified message that explains the importance of eye care. Now, OYE Broadcasting has solved that dilemma. We're excited to announce this content delivery service that is designed to expand and enhance your practice and grow the industry of optometry as a whole. Please visit OYEbroadcasting.com for more information and sign up today. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gill the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Please visit the film's website at openyoureyes2020.com, featuring interviews with more than 50 optometrists from around the country sharing information on eye care and eye disease. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Examining an infant's eyes to the general public seems almost impossible, even mystical. Patients often ask, How can an eye doctor examine infants since they can't respond to which is better, one or two? Today's guest, Connecticut-based pediatric board certified ophthalmologist, Caroline D. Benedictus, MD. Dr. Caroline will share the very sophisticated and often fun ways of caring for and delivering pediatric eye care. Dr. D. Benedictus, pediatric surgical expertise includes strabismus, cataracts, ocular trauma, and ocular genetic conditions. Dr. D. Benedictus is extensively published in numerous medical journals. Caroline, thank you for joining me today. Hi, thank you for having me. So I have to ask you, you know, there's so many different parts of the eye and eye care and ophthalmology and optometry. So why did you become a pediatric ophthalmologist? So I think pediatric ophthalmology what I really um, enjoy the most about it is that in a developing visual system, we can prevent blindness and give children uh, the ability to see for the rest of their life. And we can reverse conditions that cause blindness. And it just, the relationship that I have with parents is really uh, rewarding. It's probably one of the reasons that a lot of people may not like pediatrics, but I look at the parents as partners Uh, and my job is to really ease their fears. I mean, what parents do is they care about their kids and they want to do the best thing they can for their kids. And so my job is to allow them to, to breathe a sigh of relief and know that they're doing the best that they can for their kids. And, and it's just really rewarding. You know, we'll get it before we get into some, you know, some of the really tough things, uh, some of the surgical things and diseases. I want to ask you some of the fun questions that patients always always ask us. So the first question they always ask is, at what age will their eye color change or if it's going to change? They always want their blue eyes for their baby. Is their baby's eyes going to stay blue or at what age will it typically change? So my, both of my children, I have light eyes. My husband has dark brown eyes. Both of my children were born with blue eyes and now are dark, dark brown eyes. (laughs) Um, So eye color really, a lot of kids are born without a lot of pigment. Eye color is determined by the amount of pigment, like the color tissue inside the eye and the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. Um, And that's, the eye gets stimulated to make the pigment. So it's not, you're not always born with it. It's stimulated to uh, be made by your sympathetic nervous system. That doesn't usually start to kick in developmentally until about three months of age. So starting around three months of age, the body is then um, telling the cells inside of the eye to make pigment if it's genetically determined because it's all based on genetics. And so they'll start to gain more pigment in the um, front layer or middle layer of the iris. And you'll start to see them darken if that's what uh, genetics has determined for them. And so I would say by a year old, nine months to 12 months, you probably will know if your child's going to have light eyes versus dark eyes or if they're going to be brown eyed. However, um, they can continue to change over uh, the first few years of life. 
as they accumulate more pigments. There's some other things, uh, environmental, um, well, not environmental, but you know, trauma, um, other things like inflammation that can cause the eye color to change um, over a lifetime, actually. I think David Bowie is a great example. He has what we call a heterochromia, which are two different eye colors, uh -huh. and his was because of trauma. Um, and so you can have a lot of different reasons for your color, the color in your eye to change, but most parents can know if their child's going to have dark eyes versus light eyes, probably by nine months to a year. So the magic number is around nine months to the, to a year. Max Scherzer, the Mets pitcher has two different color eyes. Oh, and really? I, and I don't know if he has a nevus on his eye or on his okay. iris. But uh, he has two different color eyes. And my son is a big baseball player. He's very intrigued by his different color eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what age do babies actually start to see color? You know? So our color vision is determined by cells inside of our retina. The retina, I think about... Um, the, like the wallpaper in the back of the eye and there's different cells, there's rods and cones. A lot of people have probably heard of that. And so your color vision is determined by the cone cells and those come in uh, red, green, and blue. Those are not developed when we're first born. When babies are first born, they really have poor vision. They're extremely farsighted, but the part of the retina that allows them to focus on fine details is not developed yet. And that happens over the first few months of life. Um, as the cones develop, I would say between three to five months, they're probably gonna be able to discern colors. Early on, high contrast, um, black and white, is what they're gonna notice the most. So uh, all the pastel colors, all the things that are on the, the baby blankets and stuff like that, that's really for the parents and everyone else. Babies can't really discern that or textures even. Um, so high contrast uh, is the best for them to see when they're really young and probably by around four, five, six months of age, once their cones are developing, they can see more color. I, th I think it's also important to remember that um, as much as we want to categorize kids, nothing is set in stone. So it's not like one day, oh, it's five months, they have color vision. It's definitely a spectrum and kids develop and change at different rates. So it's a general um, window. I got to ask you about digital devices. You know, that's big. You know, a lot of parents, some parents don't let their kids look at digital devices at all. And some parents use digital devices as a babysitter. Mm -hmm. now, as an expert in pediatric eye care, what do you think is best and what do you think is reasonable? Well, I think it's important to remember that everything in moderation, I mean, what we think today can change over time. I, nothing in medicine is zero or a hundred percent. And so I really let research kind of drive my recommendations and I also change my recommendations as more research comes out. So I think there's a few things. There's the eyes and then there's the brain and they're connected. Uh, but I think the uh, AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics makes recommendations based on just development in general. Um, on screen time and how kids are exploring the world, it limits them from exploring the world and um, using all of their different senses. In terms of vision, I think um, the younger the child, the less screen time they should have. Um, the most, the research has shown there, there's no obvious permanent eye or vision damage from screen time, but there are things that can happen. I think the biggest thing is that it can cause stress, fatigue, and headaches. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One is that most of the time when we're using these screens, we're using them at a close up distance. And when you, when you think about the position of the eyes, your eyes go from kind of more aligned when you're looking far away to converged in this position. And you have to hold that in for a long period of time. And that can cause strain and fatigue and headaches. Um, and so what I usually say are frequent breaks. Uh, even when, um, I transitioned to doing some telemedicine um, appointments with patients and I was on the screen more. I followed all of these rules because I was having a lot of eye strain and fatigue. So every 20 minutes, looking 20 feet into the di distance, uh, sometimes blinking uh, 20 times as well. We don't blink as much when we're looking at a screen or concentrating. Um, and so our eyes dry out and we can get eye pain, 
burning, tearing, and even intermittent blurring. So, uh, so looking into the distance, frequently taking breaks, making sure we're holding these screens, not like this, up to our face. Uh, we wanna make sure it's is at a good uh, distance from us. And, and I think following those recommendations can help because face it, every, everyone's on the screens right now. Um, and it's a necessity for a lot of kids because they're either doing distance learning or they're doing work on their computers um, or tablets or iPads. My own daughter's on an iPad at uh, school. So um, I think those things can, can really help decrease some of those problems and symptoms. And the World Health Organization said less than a year, they recommend zero screen time. And how do you feel about that? Do you think that's too strict or you think that makes a lot of sense? I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I think kids are really fascinated by almost anything. <laughs> um, you know, you could sit a child in front of almost anything and they're gonna, they're experiencing it for the first time. And so they're gonna be interested. Um, so I think, you know, people are gonna do what's easiest and best for them, obviously, but I think it's screen time under a year, I don't know if there's any, there's obviously no benefit uh, for the child. And I think if you're talking strictly about vision or vision development, I don't think it's adding anything and uh, their vision will develop uh, you know, if they're just looking at toys in front of them. And they said between two and four years, like one, one hour. And was, is that something you would agree with as well? I mean, <laughs> you know, I think that it depends on what they mean by screen time. I think in an ideal world, yes. Um, the less is more at that age that they're experiencing the world. But let's face it. I mean, at least here in the United States, that's probably not going to happen. I know that the American Academy of Pediatrics has recently reviewed uh, some of their recommendations uh, to uh, account for the increased screen time that's happening now. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, that'd be ideal, but it's just not realistic. And so making sure you're trying to do things in moderation and uh, combining it with real life experiences, real world experiences is the, is the way to go. There's been some research that kids that spend a lot of time outside could decrease their risk of myopia by about 50%. Yeah. And I just wanted to see what your interpretation of that is. And uh, how, how do you feel about telling kids to go outside, spend time outside to help decrease the risk of becoming nearsighted or myopic? Well, I think recommending that kids get outside and do things that are active is always a really good recommendation. I think it's good for, you know, their mental health and, uh, you know, fights a sedentary lifestyle. So I have no problem recommending that. Um, in terms of myopia specifically, uh, I, you know, I remember, uh, a while ago, I think it was in my training, there had started to be uh, some rumbling about this topic. And the earliest studies and reports were coming out of um, Asia, because uh, there's such a high number of myopes. And I, there wasn't that much information first coming out. But over time, with the more research and more studies, those studies have more and more power because they have more participants. And so I think there's a a lot of evidence that for some reason, kids going outside uh, are decreasing their chance or risk of becoming myopic or nearsighted. Um, now, I, I don't necessarily think the studies tell us why. There are some suggestions, right? Could it be from light? Could it be from focusing far away and not sitting up close? Not all of the studies have really discerned between that, but there's something about them going outside uh, and it decreases that risk. So I, I definitely recommend it. And I think it's really good for kids in many aspects of their life, not just vision. How about a protecting kids against blue light that has become the the latest buzz, you know, blue yeah. light, looking at the digital devices. Do you have much of a feeling about blue light as far as, uh, as far as comfort, and, you know, filtering out the blue light, as far as comfort and sleep? You know, there's been some studies to suggest that. Uh, and as a pedi pe pediatric ophthalmologist, you know, top in the field, how do you guys feel about that? So I think that uh, limiting screen time because of the light exposure exposure to, um, so that they're not exposed to it too close to bedtime definitely is something I recommend uh, because it can um, 
alter your sleep habits and your circadian rhythm. Uh, so I do think cutting uh, kids off uh, before bedtime, an hour or so before bedtime is important. Uh, in terms of, do we need to protect um, kids specifically from the blue light waves? I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. Um, not right now, based on the research that's out there that I personally read. I don't think there's much credence to it. I think there's maybe some thought uh, based on theory and optics, um, which, you know, in the future, maybe I'll change my mind on that. But right now, I'm not seeing any research that makes me worried about the health of the eye. Um, you know, we get tons of blue light in sunlight. Uh, and so blue light specifically coming from screens is, um, you know, kind of small potatoes compared to the amount of blue light we get from sunlight. So if I'm recommending kids go outside to get more sunlight <laughs> and then I'm saying they can't, you know, I, sometimes it, it's, it's hard to marry those, those different ideas, you know, between the different research studies. But at this point, I'm not concerned about the blue light specifically. I mean, Apple and Google have put on uh, different settings, like a night shift or a night mode yeah. for the uh, blue light. Uh, is that something you recommend or you're not too concerned? I do. I do. I do. And I do it myself just because it, it feels better when I feel like, you know, I can go to sleep easier. Uh, but I mean, it's not going to hurt anybody. And I think, you know, it, it could help. And kids that, you know, kids that play video games, <clears throat> they're addicted to these video games and they can sit and play these video games for hours and hours and hours, uh, which, you know, to me is, is worrisome. Uh, do you think kids should be wearing blue filter lenses when they're playing the video games or maybe taking more breaks or, uh, you know, what do you think? You got it. You, you got it. I think taking more breaks. I mean, just like we said, <laughs> I have no problem telling my patients they should go outside more, take some breaks, right? It'll help you prevent uh, myopia. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think they need to wear the blue light glasses uh, for video games. Um, it, it's interesting when I was a kid, I remember the same conversations and I actually played a lot of video games mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Um, and I remember reading one study once I became an ophthalmologist that said it can increase your hand eye coordination as a surgeon. So I was like, yep, that's me. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, it, it really is just about the whole person, right? We're talking about not just eyes, we're talking about kids that are developing. So yes, everything should be in moderation at this point. Um, kids probably shouldn't be sitting around for hours playing video games. Um, what I will say about eye protection is that any game, sport, video, anything that has the potential to injure the eye, they absolutely no questions asked. They need to wear eye protection. I can't tell you how many injuries I've seen with like Nerf guns and stuff like that. So eye protection for that, blue light glasses, not, not something I'm a huge proponent of at this time. And let's turn our attention to different types of conditions, diseases, and First, let's start with prophylaxis in the hospital of newborns. In the old days, they used to use silver nitrate, and now they they got smart, and they're using a half percent erythromycin to prevent neonatal conjunctivitis. Talk about that for a little bit. You know, I think, you know, the baby's born, and, you know, of course, mothers are nervous, and they're putting this eye, st eye cream into the eye, eye ointment into the eye to prevent an eye infection. And back in the old days, when they used to use silver nitrate, a lot of kids would have reactions to that. Right. Luckily, right. Uh, they got <laughs> smarter and they're not using that anymore. So talk about neonatal con conjunctivitis a little bit. Sure. So the silver <laughs> nitrate, it would cause a little bit of a chemical conjunctivitis that would present within about 24 hours of life. Um, and I think um, not only does it cause a little bit of irritation, but there was also some chlamydia strains that were resistant. And so that's one of the reasons it also fell out of favor. Um, I think in some um, countries uh, where access to care is difficult, so the silver nitrate sticks were super easy to, to carry around and they lasted a little bit longer in some of those countries. Um, you know, I have two kids and I was really excited when my kids got the ointment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, you know, we're not just, con we're concerned about certain bacteria and certain infections that carry a high risk. Um, some of which are sexually transmitted, um, some of which aren't necessarily. Um, the risk goes down when you are in an area where people have good uh, prenatal care and medical. Um, 
help. Um, but the, the statistics aren't zero. And even with C-sections, kids are at risk. And so it's not just about an eye infection. The problem with these type of infections in children under four weeks old is that their immune systems are really not strong. Um, and so a small infection in a kid who's six, eight weeks old, or you or me, not a big deal, right? If they have an infection, we treat it, doesn't matter. But in kids under four weeks old, their bodies can't fight these infections. And the eye is really close to the brain. And these infections can spread very quickly and be very, very dangerous for these children. And so I think everything in medicine, we have to talk about risk versus benefit. Um, because otherwise, what are we doing, right? So the risk of a child getting one of these infections and then getting extremely, extremely ill or even die from infections that spread into their brain, prop for me, medically and as a parent, is just way too high compared to the risk of a little bit of ointment. Um, you know, I've had kids that have this type of infection, not from a sexually transmitted disease, from group B strep, um, and uh, they do test for that, but I've had kids that have it and they have these bad infections and they have to be admitted to the hospital. If kids get fevers under four weeks of age, they have to be admitted and they get LPs or lumbar punctures. And so when I think about risk benefit, I think the benefit at this point, even with all of the stuff we've discussed outweighs the risk at this point. And erythromycin is a very safe it uh, is. medication. I don't think too many... I don't think anyone ever has any kind of reaction to erythromycin. Not usually. I would say, um, you know, the biggest concern is if it's a bacteria that's resistant. I did have a child who had something like this and they weren't getting better. And luckily the culture came back and showed they were resistant to the erythromycin. And so we just switched the medication and luckily, you know, we were able to find that out early on. Um, but I think the risk for these children it's not that they're going to get pink eye. It's that they have a low immune system and we need to protect them until their immune system kind of ramps up. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also gonna be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Well, So the baby is born and they kind of get the, the, their, the, the pediatrician is looking at their eyes in, 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 the, in the hospital. Uh, what are they looking for? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the biggest, and, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say, and I mean, they're not, they're not a pediatric ophthalmologist. So can they look, can they look at things properly because they're not a pediatric ophthalmologist? Yes. So it's really about what we're looking for at different age groups, right? A child, I always think about it in terms of vision development and visual demand, right? So vision development is extremely, extremely important in young children and newborns, right? But their visual demand isn't that high. They're not sitting in the back of a classroom watching a teacher write on the board. They're not driving down the road looking at a street sign. So you're not concerned that the pediatrician 
then needs to pick up a small refractive error, right? We're not worried about that. We're worried at that age about anything that's going to cause a problem with their vision development. So those are things like um, structural abnormalities that you're going to see uh, in the front of the eye with a pen light exam, or you'll see by shining a light into the eye and then watching how it reflects out. Those are the best ways to really examine a child's eye and make sure they're structurally sound and that there's nothing that's going to prevent their vision development. So it's very rudimentary, uh, but that's what we're looking for at that age. Even if I examined a child at that age and found, let's say, a refractive error or something mild, if it's not affecting them or their vision development, we wouldn't do anything anyway because it's not affecting their vision development. And as they grow, some of those things we might find when they're young to work themselves out. And what would the pediatrician may find that they would refer to a pediatric specialist like yourself? So the things that they're looking for that we get really concerned about that are really urgent or emergencies are signs of uh, congenital anomalies. Congenital anomalies are things that can happen with the eye, eyeball development itself. Um, things that can go wrong either because just a fluke, it's sporadic, or because of a genetic mutation or a syndrome or a medical disease or infection. Um, so uh, uh, things like cataracts in a child. Um, cataracts in an adult who, has a, who have a fully developed visual system really aren't that big of a deal. You take them out, they can still see afterwards, but a child, when they're born, they don't have good vision and they need all of the parts of the eye to be working well so that they can learn to see and develop their vision. If they have something like a cataract, a cataract is a cloudiness of the lens on the inside of the eye that focuses for us. It blocks light from getting into the eye, into the brain. And so what ends up happening is they're not getting those cues, those uh, visual cues that we talked about earlier to develop their vision. Um, children who have cataracts that aren't uh, picked up early in life um, really have significant visual disability. So pediatricians, their, their big role is to make sure there's nothing major, no major abnormality in a child's eye that's going to prevent their vision development, like the cataracts, um, sometimes congenital glaucoma, which is high pressure in the eye. All of those things that can happen in adults, but in a, a small child with a developing visual system can be considered an emergency because if it's not taken care of in a timely manner, they won't develop normal vision. What are some signs and symptoms a parent may see at home that they know that they should be aware of to say this is a red flag and we need to refer to a, a pediatric eye specialist? I love talking to moms. Moms always know. Uh, I can't tell you how many times a mom brings their child and they're like, I saw this little thing on the eye and they totally are right and no one else believes them. But you know, the moms really are paying attention and they're really looking at their children when they're uh, feeding them. And so I always believe the moms. Um, you can see any asymmetry, anything that seems off in the shape or color of an eye can be a sign. It might not, it may just be who they are, but the eyes should be symmetric. So for example, color differences between the eyes, um, size difference between the eyes. If one eye seems really big, compared to the other. Um, those type of asymmetries, we definitely want to be evaluating those patients. Um, intermittent uh, crossed eyes, or it's called strabismus, which is the medical term for any eye misalignment. You can have some intermittent uh, eye misalignment in children because they're learning how to use their eyes. They're born and they're being used independently and they have to learn how to use them together. Um, so intermittent, like coming and going, mild uh, eye misalignment, no big deal, usually will work itself out by four months of age, definitely by six months, which when they're premature, it might take a little bit longer. Um, but an eye crossing or drifting that's large and constant, and especially if it's in one eye, that can be a sign of a problem. Shaking or jiggling eyes, that's called nystagmus. That can be a sign of an eye issue. Absolutely needs to see a pediatric eye specialist. I once had a child who you know, was getting worked up for uh, seizures and was seeing neurology, and it turns out they had bilateral cataracts. Um, nystagmus can be a sign of low vision. It can be a sign of a retinal issue. Um, it could just be how they were born, and it's 
you know, not anything that we need to treat, but we definitely want to be seeing those patients with nystagmus. Um, I think a lot of parents hopefully know also about uh, the red reflex. So nowadays you don't see it as often because uh, technology is a lot uh, more advanced, but as an ophthalmologist, I love the red reflex. So when you take a picture and the pupil, the hole in the center of the eye turns a bright red, that should be equal between the eyes and a kind of a pinkish orangish color. It's not always red, it, you know, it, but it shouldn't be dark. It shouldn't be white. If we see an asymmetry in that um, red reflex, or if the red reflex doesn't appear to be a, a, like a nice rich color, then we definitely want to be seeing those patients. That can be an indication of really anything. Uh, the thing you worry about are tumors inside the eye, uh, but it can also be a sign of uh, cataracts or even cornea issues. So everybody wants to know, how do you examine a baby? So <laughs> since, they can't respond, since they can't respond, <laughs> how, how do you examine them? So I, I guess I, you know, the reason I went into pediatrics, I think it's easier to examine a child than an adult a lot of times, because, you know, in a kid, you know, they're just scared of drops. They're scared of the unknown. They just don't like you, but they don't have all this extra baggage coming from them. So you just kind of play with them and you use your different tools. And um, so I, it really is age dependent. Um, it's more rudimentary when they're younger and then it gets more advanced as they age. So when they're younger, we're doing things like seeing if they can fixate on a target. Uh, it's really important in the young kids or even in older kids when you're using a visual target to not use anything with sound because then you're testing their hearing because th what happens is when you hear something, your eyes turn towards whatever you're hearing. And so then you're not really testing the vision. So a lot of times, you know, parents will tell me, well, when I walk into a room, they look at me so I know they can see, but sometimes that can be tricky because are they hearing the footsteps and then turning towards that? So I have... Um, for anyone that's out there, this app on my phone that has really saved me and made me look super, super smart in the emergency room when I was a resident. And they're like, how did you, you know, examine that kid? But it really is this app It's called the iHandbook. I, I'm not involved in it. I have no financial interests at all, but it's called the iHandbook and it's free, uh, at least on iPhones. And um, it looks, so I'll show you. It has all these different tests that you can do. And the one that I use the most is called PEDS fixation targets, and you can do it with or without sound. So I, this is kind of what it looks like. And so this is going to grab their attention. And so what I do is I just cover an eye like this and I move it around and I'm watching to see if they're, you know, following the target and there's a few different options. So I turn the sound off and that's how I do it. Um, a lot of times what you're looking for is consistency. You know, no one should base their treatment or assessment of a child based on, on just one test, right? Because there's variability and, and it could be that they just don't like you that day. So consistency, reproducibility, um, using things without sound, and then graduating to uh, when they're older muscle movements. Um, you can use sound for that. And using um, toys, my, my most valuable tool is this spinny light toy that I got on Amazon because it holds their attention. And that's how I kind of test how their eyes move. Um, you know, I really am doing an exam on a kid from the moment I open the door to the exam room, right? Because when I'm talking to the parent, the child feels comfortable. As soon as I turn my attention to the child, they know that I'm looking at them. And a lot of times they just will shut down. So as I'm talking to the parent, everyone's like, oh, you're, you like to, you love your job. You like playing with the kids. And I do, but I'm examining a child while I'm sitting in the room. And so I actually get a lot of information that way as well. Um, we use our lights to see how they reflect off of the eye that helps with the alignment. And then we dilate the eye so we can look in the back of the eye. Um, I can tell what a refract refractive error, um, you know, means nearsighted, farsighted astigmatism for people who don't know. Um, and I can tell what anyone's refractive error is, whether they are talking to me or not, and they can be an adult or a child. Um, when we dilate the eye, it makes the pupil really big and it paralyzes your ability to focus. And so really what you're left with is just the refractive error of the eye based on measurements. And so I shine a light called a, retin a retinoscope into the eye. And then I put different kind of lenses in front of the eye and the way and the behavior of the light 
uh, how it bounces in and out of the eye is basically what tells me their refraction. So I can really, a lot of times people will send me even adult patients who are nonverbal or developmentally delayed because I can help find out if they have a big refractive error as well. Um, so it's really just about being patient and creative and doing one thing in multiple ways. Is there a way to tell what their smell and acuity is? <laughs> so not really. I know that there's, um, you know, there's estimates, there's different ways that you can test. There are some um, testing like teller, the um, grading acuity. Um, that's when you kind of hold up cards that have big high contrast, like light lines on them and see how the child reacts to that. Um, I don't find it very reliable uh, because it's really, you, you have to be really, really good at it and you have to do it all the time. And so it really is user dependent. So I think it's based on the visual cues of the child and if they um, uh, are responding equally between the eyes when they're really young. As they get older, you can start using some of the picture charts or matching games. Um, there is a matching game that is pretty rudimentary and it, there's a conversion chart for what it could be for Snellen. So I think it's actually really hard. And I think some of the testing that predicts a Snellen visual acuity may not be that reliable because it's really user dependent. And, and, and is it really that important, you think? I mean, when you're doing all these other tests, you kind of get a good feel if they have anything seriously wrong and yeah i mean i don't know that it's that important in that it would change my management right it's all about like we said visual uh development and visual demand so the things that i'm looking for in a really young child before they can we can get a snell and visual acuity those aren't going to change how i manage them so that they develop vision really what i want to do in that age is make sure that their eyes and brain are set up to do what they're supposed to do. And then the visual acuity follows. So if we look at vision development, like you said, and we look from birth to like four months, mm -hmm. where is the baby's seeing from birth to four months? Is it all within 12 inches or is it ever beyond? And what could a parent do to kind of make that a little better to help, to help them? So definitely, you know, they can focus further away, but they, they don't prefer to because it's not, it's not easy for them. They really do like things close to their face um, because again, they are extremely, they have a big refractive error based on the curvature of their cornea, which is the clear covering on the eye and the shape of their lens that rapidly changes over the first few weeks of life. Um, but their retina, like we talked about before, their cones and their retina aren't fully developed. So they're gonna want things close high contrast, black and white, um, things are things that they can see. And so toys close to them, um, they can see movement, but slow movement. I think one of the things that worries parents a lot that I have to reassure them about is that they tell me that their child can't see or they're not following the way that they think they should. And so when I ask them to show me what they mean, you know, they're taking a toy and they're moving it like this. And, and a child's visual development, they're not going to be able to follow movement quickly, slow movement. If you start doing slow horizontal movement, you're gonna know that your child is able to fixate. If you're moving it back and forth really quick, they just can't, their eye is not developed enough. They also develop horizontal movement before vertical movement. So it's really super normal for parents to not see their child look up and down. You're gonna see the horizontal movement first, vertical follows. So toys, high contrast, slow movement, close up in the first few months of life are really going to uh, allow them to kind of see and uh, you're going to be able to see them develop that vision. And you said before if their eye turns in or goes out a little bit and is not consistent up to two or three months that is not necessarily abnormal. No, because their their brain is getting used to using both eyes together and so there's going to be times where they're trying to focus and you may see the eyes kind of go in and out or one drift. Um, that is totally normal and expected. The times I get concerned are when it's a large amount. So an eye, instead of just kind of being very mild, it's in a lot or it's out a lot or it's consistent, um, such as it's not coming and going, but it's constant. That's a sign that there could be something wrong. Even even under two months, that would be a sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's a large, constant eye turn, I would want to see the patient. 
you know, that's something that I would say, talk to your pediatrician about. And the pediatrician should at that point, take a look and likely refer them um, to an eye specialist because it could be a sign that there's something wrong. Intermittent, you know, little eye misalignment, totally normal development. And five to eight months, uh, death perception, color vision starts to develop. Uh, what are some of the things parents could do to help with stimulate vision in the five to eight month old? So I think putting toys further away, um, you know, at that age, they may be starting to crawl, um, kind of putting toys out of their reach so that they have to crawl and, you know, allow them to be coordinated. Um, you can do um, color, you know, at that point, you could probably go more into the pastel colors and you don't necessarily need the high contrast. Um, at that age, they're likely seeing more textures as well. Uh, so you can use, um, I've seen a lot of the toys with the different textures and, and they're going to learn about their environment, but they're also going to visually uh, see different stimulation. And say at nine to 12 months at a year old, uh, you know, their, their distance judgment is getting a little bit better. Uh, encourage them to crawl, creep. What are some of the things they can do to help their visual development as they're getting older from nine to 12 to one or two years old? When do you start maybe adding a ball or blocks or things like that? So as soon as they're developmentally ready, you can uh, start, uh, you know, rolling balls to them and allowing them to kind of locate the ball, catch, catch the ball while you're rolling. And then as they get older and can actually catch a, a large ball, that will help their hand-eye coordination and their vision development. Um, you know, starting depth perception and 3D vision are not actually the same thing. Um, depth perception is something you can have with just one eye, right? You don't need both eyes to have depth perception. Um, if I cover an eye or take an eye out for some reason, um, people eventually learn to develop their depth perception, which is size differential, shading differential. You know, people with one eye, they're not walking into walls, right? Three-dimensional vision is the higher definition stereoscopic vision where your brain is taking in input from two eyes that are separated in space and then overlaying them to allow you to see three dimensions. That's where kids and their eyes and vision development, that's really super important at that age because when they're still learning to use their eyes together, that's when their brain is developing those connections to overlay those images and form three dimensions. Sometimes parents will come to me and say, my child seems clumsy. Um, that's them learning, you know, their stereoscopic vision, their depth perception, you know, they're trying things out, they're learning what those different visual cues are. So walking, cruising, um, that's all, their brain is amazing and it's a sponge and it's learning all of those things at, the, at that time. Do you recommend any kind of nutrition to help this along like omega-3s or foods that contain lutein and zeaxanthin in it? Is that something that you ever recommend to parents? I don't, um, you know, I think just it's hard enough being a parent and making sure your kid is eating, right? Um, I have one good eater and one of my children doesn't like to eat anything. And I don't know how he's, you know, as tall as he is. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really about just trying your best to have a well-balanced diet. Um, and then I think some of the dietary uh, recommendations coming in, um, you know, I have seen... Um, kids with, you know, ocular genetic disorders, retinal dystrophies, and some of the older recommendations were flat recommendations for retinal dystrophies, um, you know, even in kids of vitamin A and those type of things. And, and we're learning now that the genetics are so complicated for those different retinal dystrophies. And there's so many different ones that actually those flat recommendations can hurt one type and help another. So um, I don't like to make any flat recommendations unless it's a proven uh, medical condition that you know they're gonna be deficient in something uh, other than a well-balanced diet. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural and it's a good product. 
Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.